We loved the flat the moment we followed the letting agent through the door. It wasn't like our previous rentals. The carpets were clean, not marred by stains left by previous tenants. The walls were crack-free and the windows well insulated with frames that weren't crumbling to pieces. The bathroom had a bath and a shower. There was no black mold, none at all. My roommate Celia tested the water pressure and it was great. We started living together at university and it's been the two of us ever since, neither having found a boyfriend to settle down with. We had previously shared five flats on a low budget. None of them came close to this. The living room and bedrooms were huge, and the kitchen and bathroom were fairly spacious. In most of our old flats, we could stretch out our arms in the smaller rooms and touch the walls on either side. Not here. So we were confused. It didn't make sense that the rent was cheaper than anywhere we'd lived before. I've always bought into the mantra, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. But we couldn't find anything wrong with the place. Celia asked the letting agent if the neighbors were from hell. I asked if somebody had died on the property. The agent answered no to both questions. I pressed him further on why the rent was so cheap. He said the landlady takes pride in her properties and likes to make it perfect for every new tenant. He told us there had been a high turnover of tenants because they found new jobs or wanted to be closer to the train station. So it was proving expensive for the landlady to keep up with extensive cleaning and repairs every time. He said she hoped by offering a bargain price she'd find long-term tenants. This seemed a reasonable explanation. We shouldn't have believed him. The weirdness started the day we moved in. Our flat is on the third floor. I was carrying a box up the stairs when I heard Celia scream from inside the flat. I hurried up the stairs as fast as I could while lumbered with the heavy box. I shoved the box in the hall and found my roommate in the living room. She was pale and her hands were shaking. What's wrong? I asked. She replied, I'm just being silly. I thought I saw someone in the mirror. The wall above the fireplace was already decorated with our large gold-rimmed mirror a relic from our university days. Who was it? I asked. A woman about our age, Celia told me. She was all gray, like she was covered in dust or something. Nobody passed me on the stairs after I heard Celia scream. There isn't another way they could have gotten out. I must be tired, Celia said, dismissing the incident with a forced laugh as she resumed decorating the mantelpiece. That night, the lights kept flickering. The problem continued throughout our first week, we reported it to the landlady. She promptly sent her electrician. He found no fault in the wiring. He suggested changing the light bulbs. We did, but the issue continued. We didn't want to make a fuss, so we just put up with it. Celia was at work when I saw the woman for the first time. I was returning the whiskey decanter to its place in the cabinet when I caught movement in the glass doors. I spun around, my heart racing, but nobody was there. I told myself it was little more than a shadow and wondered if it was caused by light coming through the window. I thought, or maybe convinced myself, that I imagined seeing a woman because of Celia's experience the day we moved in. But she was just as Celia described. Gray, as if covered in dust. I thought she seemed translucent as well. The next evening I was reading in the living room. I glanced up from my book and saw the woman in the TV screen. My heart sped up. I refused to look away. I wanted to be certain it was real. She was pretty, although it was impossible to tell her eye or hair color because of her gray appearance. Who are you? I asked feebly. I turned to face where she should have been standing. She wasn't there. When I looked back at the TV screen, she was gone. Then I realized she had been in front of all the furniture in the reflection. If she were behind me like I first thought, she would have been amongst the furniture. She had been looking out of the TV screen like she was peering through a window. That night, I wondered if we had a third roommate, a ghost. Celia saw her three more times. I eventually stopped running when she screamed, knowing the cause of the commotion would be a brief sighting of the ghost. Celia pleaded with me. I can't live in a haunted flat anymore, Steph. We need to move. I wasn't so keen to leave. We weren't going to find another flat like this, not even close. 
Yes, the sightings were frightening, and the temperamental electrics were annoying, as well as the lights, the TV, and internet would often cut out. But the ghost hadn't done anything to harm us. We only ever saw her in reflections. But I'd heard horror stories of benign spirits turning malignant. I can't pretend I felt completely safe in my own home. We stopped cleaning reflective surfaces for fear of encountering the spirit. Celia applied minimal makeup and no longer straightened her hair. I suspected she didn't want to spend any longer in front of a mirror than she had to. That night, I politely asked the ghost to leave us alone. I couldn't see her, but I hoped she was listening. I told her I didn't want to move, but Celia was becoming desperate. I asked if there was anything I could do to help her move on. There was no reply, not that I really expected a response. The next day, Celia invited a friend over. She introduced him as Sam. We hadn't met before. I asked Celia who he was. I knew all of her friends. And she said they met on the street earlier that day. I was horrified she had given our address to some random guy she just met. But she said they got chatting and hit it off. She noticed we were almost out of wine, so she went to buy a fresh bottle and told me to order pizza. As soon as she left, I got a bad vibe from Sam. I felt uneasy being alone with him. I decided to go to the bathroom and take a long time in there, liking the thought of having a locked door between us. But before I could close the door, he barged into the bathroom behind me and slammed me against the wall. Pain coursed through my body. He pinned my arms to the wall. I tried to knee him in the balls, but it didn't connect and he kicked me in the stomach. I cried out and doubled over in pain. Well, as much as I could while being pressed against the wall. I tried to call for help, but he forced both of my arms against the wall with one hand so he could block my mouth with the other. The more you struggle, the more I'll hurt you, he hissed, his stale breath putrid on my face. It made me want to gag. The lights started flickering aggressively. What the hell, he muttered before seemingly deciding to ignore it and tugging up my skirt. Suddenly, he stumbled backwards, tumbling to the floor, crying like a wounded dog. His eyes were full of terror. I followed his gaze to the mirror. The woman was there. This time, her delicate features were warped. Her face contorted to the point that she hardly looked human. She bared two fangs like a vampire. Sam stumbled to his feet and ran whimpering from the flat. What's your name? I asked the woman as she faded from the mirror. I waited for a response, but none came. I raced out of the bathroom to grab a knife when I heard the front door open. I was worried Sam was returning, but it was Celia. I told her what happened. She felt terrible and apologized profusely for inviting him into our home. I told her the woman saved me, and I shared my suspicions that we were living with the spirit of a vampire-type creature. Perhaps if vampires have no reflection in life, they have nothing but a reflection in death. I mean, their final death, after being staked. It's all guesswork. I don't know anything about vampires outside of what I've seen in movies and TV shows. I'm also not sure we did see her in the reflection. It was more like she could look out from reflective surfaces. We decided not to move and discuss doing some research to possibly find a way to help our ghost move on. When I returned to the bathroom, a word was written on the mirror in a strange black substance. It looked otherworldly. Glittering particles appeared to move in the lettering. Some of the letters were the wrong way, like she'd struggled to write backwards so it would be the right way for me. The name faded in a second, but I had time to make it out. Adrian. I grew up in a village that holds an annual Easter egg hunt for the local children, age 6 to 10. I've recently moved away for college. My parents still live there. They think the hunt will be canceled soon because fewer children attend every year. They have no idea why. I do. When I was 8, I didn't want to do the hunt. But my mom had the day off and she had been looking forward to it for weeks. Her eyes lit up whenever the hunt came up in conversation. She worked herself to the bone to provide for us. She thought she'd finally get to watch us having fun, so I couldn't bring myself to pretend to be ill like I'd done the previous year when my dad planned to take us. 
We just need to make sure we don't come last, I whispered to my six-year-old sister as we walked to the village square. We were fearful because my circle of friends had noticed that every year, the child that finds the least amount of eggs goes missing a few weeks or months later. The adults hadn't connected the disappearances to the hunt, and if any child dared to point it out, they were quickly dismissed. There were stalls selling homemade cakes and jams in the village square. There was also a game of hook-a-duck. Spirits were high, amongst the adults at least. At 2 p.m., the mayor announced that 200 small chocolate eggs were hidden around the village. Us children had 10 minutes to find as many as we could and get back to the village square. The winner would get a mystery prize. Few children seemed excited by this. Most of us looked terrified. My sister was shaking. I held her hand and whispered that it would be all right. She was nimble and quick on her feet. I was confident she wouldn't come last. I was overweight and my glasses were due a new prescription. I was worried I wouldn't notice the eggs. Look at fatty four eyes, Janet Digby snickered, pointing at me. Her best friend Stacy forced a laugh. Stacy was kind but had to pretend not to be around Janet. The mayor counted down from three, signaling the start of the hunt. My sister and I had agreed to look in different directions to give us both the best chance of finding as many eggs as possible. If we stayed together, only one of us would be able to claim each egg we found. I panicked when the mayor called through his megaphone that we had four minutes left. I only had three eggs. Fortunately, I managed to find another eight in quick succession. I ran back to the square as fast as I could when the mayor announced we had 30 seconds remaining. I got back just in time, panting for breath. Janet was laughing at me and whispering something to Stacy. Stacy didn't appear to be listening and looked pale. My sister was clinging to my dad. How many eggs did you find? I asked. She looked at me with terror in her eyes. Only eight, she squeaked. That's okay, said Cody, a boy from my sister's class who was standing nearby. Stacy tripped on the bridge and most of her eggs fell in the river. She only has four left. I breathed a sigh of relief, although I felt devastated for Stacy. The mayor asked us all to gather around for the results. The mayor's assistant went around counting the eggs collected by each child. My heart leapt in fear when I saw Janet pass some of her eggs to Stacy. Nobody else seemed to notice. I yelled out, pointing at them, but they fiercely denied it. Janet's mother stepped forward. How dare you accuse my daughter of cheating just because you and your half-wit sister are going to lose? My mom lunged towards Janet's mom, but my dad held her back. Let's keep things civil, the mayor said in a jovial tone. Then he asked, did anyone else see Janet give Stacy some of her eggs? Nobody but Cody raised a hand. Cody's mom quickly pushed his arm down. Janet's mom was Cody's mom's boss. The egg hunt is a bit of fun. I'm prepared to give Janet and Stacy the benefit of the doubt, the mayor concluded, not realizing the consequences of his decision. My sister was now in last place. A girl in my class called Charisse won first prize. The mayor gave her a selection of sweets, cuddly toys, and coloring books. Most of the village clapped and cheered. I was only concerned with consoling my terrified sister. I held her as she cried. My dad said it didn't matter, that it was just a game, and Charisse would have won even if the mayor had believed me. He didn't know what we did. I slept in my sister's room from that night forward, until the creature came for her. I guess you could call the creature the Easter Bunny, but he wasn't fluffy and cute. He was almost seven feet tall and stood up like a human on his hind legs. His dark brown fur was filthy and matted, with tufts missing in places, exposing red, raw skin. His claws were overgrown and yellowed, curling around. They made a scratching noise on the wooden floor of my sister's bedroom with every step he took. His buck teeth were brown and chipped. He gave off a decaying stench that made my eyes water. His eyes were the worst part. They were completely black, somehow lifeless and alive with dark energy at the same time. I don't know how he got in the house. I think I must have woken by the stench or the noise his claws made. He approached my sister's bed. She was quivering, tears running down her face. Please take me instead, I begged. He turned to look at me before proceeding to pick up my sister in his mouth, securing his grip on her with his overgrown front claws. She struggled but couldn't get free. I tried hitting him with my sister's bedside lamp. The glass lampshade shattered against his hind leg. He stopped. Then he casually kicked me away with that same hind leg. I screamed in pain when my body collided with my sister's bedside table. I shrieked and shrieked, hoping my parents would hear, but somehow I knew they wouldn't. The creature must have some way of subduing parents while he steals their children. The atmosphere in the room felt wrong somehow, like time had slowed to a stop and we were the only ones still moving. 
please, I called out to him in a last-ditch attempt. Stacy cheated. Janet gave her some of her eggs. He walked towards me with heavy steps. He lowered himself so his face was right in front of mine. I could feel his rotten breath hot on my skin. The smell was sickening. He looked into my eyes. I could feel my memories passing between us. I saw some of them flash by in my mind. My mom crying to my dad about bills we couldn't afford. Janet pushing my head into the toilet bowl. My sister laughing while our dog shook water over her. And finally, Janet passing Stacy the chocolate eggs. The bunny gently put my sister down on her bed. Then he left the bedroom without a backward glance. We cried most of the night. My sister was traumatized and I felt guilty about Stacy. I didn't want to condemn her to that creature's clutches, but I couldn't let him take my sister. I knew Stacy would be missing when we arrived at school the next day. So imagine my surprise when I saw her in the playground. I ran towards her, convinced my eyes were betraying me. It was Stacy. My joy died when I realized the creature might take her that night. Maybe he didn't have time the previous night, having visited our house first. My teacher called out that all pupils were to go to the assembly hall immediately. I'm afraid I have sad news, the headmaster began. Janet Digby disappeared last night. If you saw her after 9 p.m., it's very important you tell your teacher. You won't be in trouble, but you need to come forward because she could be in danger. Nobody came forward, as I knew they wouldn't. With the hunt about to be discontinued in my village, be wary if one suddenly starts in yours. I don't know where Janet ended up, but I know the creature took her there. The jocks were throwing an Easter egg hunt in the woods. I wasn't sure how much egg hunting would be involved as opposed to excessive drinking, a week before the most important exam of the semester, no less. We should have been studying, but my roommate Katie had a crush on Elliot, so I reluctantly agreed to go. Our friend Cece was driving. We followed Elliot's hand-drawn map to an area so rural, I was worried Cece's car would get a puncture and we'd be stranded. There was no phone signal this far from civilization, so we wouldn't be able to call AAA. Against the odds, the little car reached the point it could go no further. We got out and followed Elliot's map on foot through wild woodland. There were few footpaths. I regretted my decision to wear high heels. Thorns tore my new dress more than once. It was like they wanted to stop me going any further. I was about to suggest turning back when Todd, Elliot's right-hand man, called my name. Chloe, you made it, he said with a grin that didn't look right to me. There was something condescending about it. Where is everyone? Cece asked. Aside from us girls, it was just Todd, Elliot, and their friend Garrett in the small clearing. I had been under the impression half the college would be there. I told them it was canceled, Elliot replied. I thought it would be better as a more intimate affair, you know. Katie was beaming and Cece nodded approval, but I felt uneasy. We were miles from anywhere. I hadn't told anyone where we were going because I assumed most of the students at our college not only knew, but were also attending. The clearing was too small to host more than 10 people. I doubted Elliot ever intended to throw a big party here, and that set alarm bells ringing in my mind. Todd took three Easter eggs from his backpack. Their foil glistened in the moonlight. One for each of you, he said, leering at each of us in turn. It made my skin crawl. Todd and Garrett dashed into the woods, presumably to hide the eggs. They returned about five minutes later. Elliot passed around drinks and weed. I refused both, occasionally pretending to take sips and hits when Cece or the boys pressured me. The others were laughing and joking, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. When's the hunt starting? Katie asked. I don't know what's a good idea to be wandering around in the dark now that we've been drinking, I said. Lighten up, will you? Cece snapped. Actually, Chloe's right to be apprehensive, Elliot began. Ladies, I'm afraid I brought you here under false pretenses. You see, there is going to be a hunt, but it ain't for Easter eggs, the other boys snickered. Elliot removed three archery bows from behind a large tree. He kept one and gave the others to Garrett and Todd. Then he handed out bags of arrows. You have two minutes to run, he told us. Then we find you. This is a joke, right? Cece said, her voice shaking. Elliot answered, No joke. If you want to waste your remaining time standing here with your head in the sand, be my guest. It'll take the fun out of it, though, so I'd prefer you get moving. I kicked off my heels and pulled my girls away from the clearing into the woods. I knew it was real. I never liked those boys, and something had seemed off since we arrived. What do we do? Cece asked, her voice breathy. I was worried she was about to have a panic attack. I have an idea, Katie whispered. We climb a tree. I read it in a novel once. They never look up. 
But if they do, we'll be trapped, I said. I'm guessing they know these woods better than we do. It's our best chance, Katie insisted. I decided she was right. I had considered running to the car, but we weren't sure of the way, and stopping to check the map would slow us down. The boys would almost certainly catch us before we got there. Cece and I followed Katie while she looked for the right tree, the moonlight our only guide. We decided against using the torches on our phones, in case it gave away our position. We still had no signal, so we couldn't call for help. This one, Katie whispered. The first branch was well above our heads. We can't get up there, I told her. That's why it's perfect. They'll think it's too high, but we can make it if we boost and pull each other up. We heard Garrett whistling as we helped Cece up. I looked around in panic, but he was nowhere in sight. I wondered if he was waiting for us, waiting for us to become sitting ducks in the tree. Cece pulled Katie up, and then they both helped me. We climbed higher as quickly as we could. We settled on a sturdy branch we didn't think could be seen from the ground. Other branches concealed us, or so we hoped. We could see the ground, so technically someone on the ground could probably see us. Cece's breathing was heavy as a panic attack took hold, but I was confident the wind would cover the sound. My heart raced as Elliot passed by below. An hour went by, according to my watch. Every time the boys passed us, they seemed more agitated. Their car is still there, Garrett said. He was standing with the others, a short distance from our tree. I had noticed Garrett trying to take Cece's bag earlier. He must have been planning to take her car keys. At the time, I thought he was trying to steal money. I'm glad I sat on her bag and made it impossible for him to take anything. I think they must be up a tree, Todd said. Start looking, Elliot barked. They went off in different directions. Todd shone his flashlight into a few trees nearby before stopping to kneel in a way that involved resting his shins and forearms on the ground. What's he doing? Katie whispered. I was too scared to answer in case he heard me, but I knew he was praying. My grandmother was known as the local madwoman in my hometown until her death two years ago. She used to crouch like that when worshipping the Vojka Darach, a dark druid that derives its power from nature. Todd stood up. He was about to shine his torch into our tree, but Garrett called his name. When he was out of sight, I started climbing down. What are you doing? Katie hissed. To find the Easter eggs, I told her. Are you crazy? How's that going to help? He was praying to the Vojka Druid, I explained. My grandma said that entity is cruel but fair. They can't offer us as sacrifices without giving us a fair chance. I don't know what you're talking about, Katie said, but she followed me down from the tree. We had known each other since childhood, and she trusted me. Stay where I can see you, but look for the eggs, I whispered to her. Cece was too anxious to come down from the tree. We decided she was safest there until we had found the eggs. I've got one, Katie said. She threw it to me. It was still in the air when an arrow shot out through her mouth, spraying her teeth towards me. I screamed. Elliot appeared behind Katie, laughing like a maniac. I ran forward to catch Katie as she fell. Her weight sent me stumbling and Todd's arrow flew over my head, buzzing through the air like a vicious insect. It missed me by millimeters. I couldn't hold Katie up, so I guided her gently to the ground. Blood leaked from her mouth, pouring around the arrow. Her grip on my hand went loose. I shrieked in grief, thinking she had died, but then she pushed me away with limited strength. She wanted me to save myself. I hated leaving her, but flight mode took control of my body when I noticed Elliot about to fire another arrow. I dodged between trees, tearing open the Easter egg as I went, tears pouring from my eyes. I knew Katie was gone. Elliot would make sure she didn't survive. I separated the two halves of chocolate egg to find a furry object inside. It took me a moment to realize what it was in the darkness. I dropped it in horror. A rabbit's foot. I hastily picked it up. My grandma used to say rabbit's feet were good luck. I knew I had to get further away from Elliot and Todd. I stumbled out from behind a tree straight into Garrett's path. His bow was already loaded and ready to fire. I prepared to feel the arrow tear through my heart, but it never came. Garrett was looking straight through me. I realized he couldn't see me. As improbable as it seemed, the rabbit's foot was giving me invisibility. I was directly in front of him with a full moon spotlighting me. There was no other explanation. I kept still and breathed slowly, knowing being invisible didn't necessarily mean I was inaudible. A jagged rock caught my eye. I thought about hitting Garrett over the head with it to take one of them out, but I couldn't do it. The temptation was almost overwhelming, but my parents had always warned me against violence. My grandma said to kill another tears your soul apart. If I was going to die, I was going to leave this world having remained true to myself with my soul intact. Garrett walked away towards where I last saw the other boys. A glimmer of foil shimmering in the moonlight caught my eye. It was another egg, almost concealed by muddy leaves. I grabbed it and crept back to Cece's tree. After checking the boys weren't in earshot, I whispered to Cece to come down. It took some coaxing, but minutes later, she was beside me. I gave her the second egg and told her to open it. 
It contained a beautiful pendant with an amber stone. She looked at me blankly. I took it from her hands and placed it around her neck. I told her to touch the rabbit's foot, but I wasn't sure if we both had invisibility. I soon found out. Cece, Todd chuckled, apparently unaware I was right beside her. He fired an arrow. I couldn't stop the scream that escaped my mouth. Cece threw a defensive arm in front of her face. With that gesture, the arrow dispersed into tiny particles before vanishing into thin air. Todd's jaw hung open in shock. My face must have worn a similar expression. I saw the same dilemma I faced earlier with Garrett and the jagged rock in Cece's eyes, and I saw it reached a different conclusion. She raised her arm again, her hand flat as if pushing something towards Todd. His body separated into thousands of tiny fragments that were taken by the wind before he even had time to scream. We made it through the woods without running into the other boys. The car was in sight when the bushes rustled behind us. We spun around. I pushed Cece's hand down on instinct. I'm eternally grateful to whatever made me do that because it wasn't one of the boys that came staggering into view. It was Katie, the arrow still protruding through her mouth. We helped her into the car. Cece sat her in the back while I drove to the hospital. It's lucky Garrett hadn't thought to let down the tires. Katie had to be rushed in for emergency surgery. The surgeon said it was a miracle the arrow had gone through her neck at an angle that didn't paralyze her or hit a major artery. I wondered if she had found the third Easter egg and whether it contained some kind of healing elixir, but she was barely conscious and wrote to the hospital, and we haven't been able to speak to her yet. She will need reconstructive surgery, but the initial life-saving operation went well, and she's expected to make a full recovery. The police went looking for Elliot and Garrett. We decided it would be easier not to mention Todd. They found both boys deceased, with every drop of blood drained from their bodies. We were interviewed as potential suspects, but the police didn't see how we could have done it. Todd was caught on CCTV that night getting into Elliot's car and hasn't been seen since. It turns out he served time in a juvenile detention center in his early teens after almost beating another boy to death for no reason, so he's the prime suspect. His face is plastered all over the news. Vampire rumors spread around college, but after digging out some of Grandma's old books, I discovered this is how the Vojka Darach punishes those that unsuccessfully attempt a sacrifice. We lived, so they had to die. Grandma's books claim the brave-hearted might attempt such a sacrifice because although the price of failure is extortionate, so are the rewards for success. Cece's father won the lottery the day after she killed Todd. Cece herself was offered her dream job despite not having graduated yet. She's also engaged to her soulmate. It's been little more than a week since that night in the woods, and she was single then. You might be wondering if this makes me regret my decision not to kill Garrett. The honest answer is no. I remain true to myself. I thought I could survive with the help of the rabbit foot alone, so that's what I did. I'm proud of my girls and myself. Even Cece didn't kill for riches like the boys planned to, she did it to protect herself and her friends. If you're wondering if I still have invisibility, I don't. The rabbit's foot and the pendant mysteriously went missing the next day. Grandma's books warned this would happen, but apparently our talismans will find us like we found them, when we need them most. My name is Nick. My life would have been pathetically unremarkable if not for one thing. I was born a werewolf. It's not like the movies. I wasn't bitten in the woods while camping with idiotic friends, and we don't turn into rabid dogs on the full moon, or go around biting the aforementioned idiotic campers. I've never heard of anyone getting turned by a bite or scratch. There's a rumor that's how the curse was spread at the dawn of time, but I don't remember ever caring. It's genetic, almost untraceable. Most medical treatments won't pick up on it, but we avoid in-depth examination of our DNA just in case. My cousin Sheldon is a werewolf too. Not everyone in the family got the gene. Besides from our late grandfather, it's just us. Sheldon knows one or two others online. Men seem more prone to the gene than women, Sheldon doesn't know any female werewolves, but apparently they exist. He says they're twice as powerful, but he believes in any old rubbish he reads on the dark web. He also read that there are no more than a hundred of our kind in the whole world. But again, I don't recall caring. As I said, we don't turn into wolves on the full moon, or at all. Our powers are strongest around the full moon, but we can use them whenever we like. Most of our skills aren't that impressive, 
slightly more body hair than the average person, sharper and faster growing nails that can protrude slightly when needed. Acute hearing, flawless eyesight, you'll never see one of us wearing glasses. We hew quicker than the average person, but not at a rate anyone would find alarming. My grandfather died at 108. He beat cancer three times without treatment. But unfortunately, the fourth time was too aggressive, even for werewolf healing speed. That's the problem. We can recover from wounds that would be fatal to humans. But our bodies still need time to fight the disease or injury. This means we can be killed almost as easily as anyone else. An ordinary bullet does the job. No silver required. That pretty much sums up life as a werewolf. I suppose there's one more thing I should mention. I was 13 when I first experienced the most remarkable trait of our condition. Gramps didn't tell me about the werewolf gene until I was 15. So the experience was confusing as hell. I was walking down the school corridors with my mates. We were planning to ditch our lesson and go to the park instead. Lesson had already started, so we were the only ones about. Suddenly the corridor vanished, and I found myself in the toilets with Troy Parker in my face. He was this asshole a few years above me, and we did our best to stay out of his way. It was disgusting. I could almost taste the stale cigarettes on his breath. His spit hit my face when he called me a whore and said whores get what they deserve. I tried to move, but I couldn't feel my body. It was like I wasn't really there, sort of like a dream. Then I heard my friends repeating my name and I was back in the corridor. My mates were asking if I was ill, but I ignored them. The girls' toilets were just ahead of us on the right. On instinct, I went in. My mates followed, still asking what was going on. One was muttering that I had gone crazy and perhaps they shouldn't hang out with me anymore. Troy was in the toilet, pinning Roxanne Maxwell against the wall. It's lucky my mates were there because I couldn't have fought him off alone. He took off when we realized it was seven of us and Roxanne was terrified. At first I thought it was because of Troy, but she was staring at me and looked at me like I was a freak. I didn't understand how. I knew she was there. My mate Rob thought it was a glitch in the matrix, whatever that means. A year later, I was walking back to Rob's place after a house party. It was gone midnight. It was the first time I had been drunk and high, and I abruptly found myself in an abandoned warehouse. There was yelling. A masked assailant rushed towards me with a machete, like something from a low-budget horror movie, and I braced myself for impact, but felt nothing. Then I was lying on the ground, Rob laughing as he drunkenly pulled me up. Like an idiot, I didn't associate this with the Roxanne incident and assumed it was a combination of drugs and alcohol. I thought I had briefly passed out and had some kind of nightmare. The next day, the news reported that the body of a young man had been found in a disused warehouse about a mile from where I had been the night before. He had been fatally wounded by a large blade possibly a machete. I couldn't have done anything. I was nearly a mile away and he was killed within 30 seconds of my vision. I couldn't have got there in the time even if I had realized what was going on. But I started to piece things together. It was like I could see through the eyes of victims when they needed help most. They call and I come. I thought I was psychic until Gramp sat us down and told us about the werewolf gene. Sheldon had a hard time believing him. For months he thought Gramps had gone senile, and I believed it instantly. I told Gramps about Roxanne and the murdered man, and he said something similar had happened to him. He was once able to save a child from drowning. Sheldon finally accepted the truth when it happened to him. His friend Bex thought some guy was following her. Turns out the man was just walking in the same direction. Bex is always hanging around Sheldon like a fly to a carcass. She's probably in love with him, but he's gay. Anyway, I had a few more visions over the years. Sometimes I could help, sometimes not. It never happened outside of a one mile radius or in a non-emergency situation. It was 2.30 at night when this happened. Sheldon persuaded me to go to Bex's cousin's friend's neighbor's party. I didn't want to go because it was in the city. 
and we had to catch three trains to get out of our dead-end town, none of us wanting to forfeit a free bar to be designated driver. We were too broke to get a taxi. The party sucked, we didn't know anyone and it turned out to be bring your own bottle. Should have figured Bex didn't know her cousin's neighbour that well, the alleged free bar had been Chinese whispers. So we were pretty much sober, and Shoulder ran to the nearest off license, but as I said we were broke. Werewolves also have a higher alcohol tolerance than humans, we need to drink a lot to get drunk. We left just after 11 feeling deflated, and at that time of night there was 40 minutes to wait for our last train. I needed to slash after Sheldon's cheap booze. The small train station didn't have any restrooms, so I decided to wander over to the public toilets a five minute walk away. The streets were almost deserted. The town next to ours on the train line is equally run down. The public restrooms were unlocked, hell there wasn't even a door, so I went inside. I did my business and left the grimy restroom. That's when they jumped me. I was smacked round the head with something the moment I stepped back into the night. They must have been waiting, pressed against the wall. My nails jutted out but I couldn't get a clear strike at my assailants. It's hard to aim when your vision is like a fairground ride. I was dragged back into the restroom. I hoped a passing Samaritan would help me, but there were no shops open, no nightlife, and no reason at all for anyone to be out. There were at least three of them. I heard voices, all with a distinct accent, Australian, Russian, German. We lived in an incredibly unremarkable industrial area. It's the kind of place people dream of leaving. There's next to no tourism, and I found it odd that three men of different nationalities would visit the same area at the same time, let alone together. My vision settled a little, I noticed that they were wearing socks with no shoes probably so I wouldn't hear them following me. I kicked myself because I would have noticed if I'd have been paying more attention to my surroundings, shoes or no shoes. I couldn't make out everything they were saying, because I was drifting in and out of consciousness, but the German boy called me wolf boy and I went numb with panic when I realised they knew. I wondered if Sheldon's excursions on the dark web led them to us. A blade tore my body open from neck to navel, the cut wasn't deep enough to kill, but painful enough to make me cry in agony. I knew the wound wasn't fatal, but I couldn't fight or stand. If I made any attempts, they kicked me down, aggravating the wound in the process. In that moment, I regretted never taking any self-defense classes. I guess I always assumed being a werewolf would be enough, as insignificant as the condition often felt. I must have stayed this way for 10 minutes. The Australian was asking why the other one hadn't turned up yet, and I realised the other one meant Sheldon. Then I figured it out. They thought I would call Sheldon the same way Roxanne Maxwell called me all those years ago. I laughed. I laughed so hard the wound on my chest became unbearably painful. The German barked at me demanding to know what was up. I told them I'd never bring Sheldon here, and I told them one has to desperately want to be found for it to work, and Sheldon coming here was the last thing I wanted. The blade sank into my stomach, my mouth filled with metallic blood, and I felt the warm liquid run down my chin and onto my chest. The men left the restroom saying they would try to get Sheldon on the platform or the train without anyone seeing. One said they should have gone to our houses, but another said the neighbours would have noticed or heard and after the footsteps faded I used my own blood to write on my arm. It said run, don't go home. I held my arm in front of my face and focused on the words, then I let Sheldon see. I could feel him in my head. It was a strange sensation, almost alien. This must have been why Roxanne was so frightened. She felt me invade her mind and see through her eyes. Sheldon stayed until the darkness claimed me. Sometimes I wish I wasn't the first person in my family to go to college, and that I would have been content to just join my parents and cousins in the family bakery. Then the events of this story wouldn't have happened. 
I had an interview for a place at an art college. The college in question was my second choice, but I was still excited. It was my first interview, my first time driving outside my tiny hometown since getting my driver's license, and my sister Lucy and best friend Jamie were coming along for the ride. We'd been looking forward to the trip for weeks. It was a nine-hour drive, so we left early the day before the interview. We had booked a hotel near the college to stay overnight. The route was mostly on the interstate, so I expected to make good time. And we did, for the first six hours. Then the radio warned us an overturned truck was causing delays ahead. Lucy googled it on her phone. There's been an oil leak and it's gridlocked, she told us. I hope everyone's okay, Jamie said from the back seat. Lucy said, the truck driver was sent to the hospital with minor injuries. Luckily, no one else was hurt. I asked, does it say when things will get moving again? She replied, no, but the leak looks serious and they'll have to move the truck. It says major delays are to be expected and not to travel if possible. I groaned in frustration. I did not want to be tired for my interview. It had already been a long day of driving. I knew I'd be exhausted the next day if we arrived at our hotel late at night. I pulled over onto the shoulder and studied the sat-nav on my phone, searching for an alternative route. We were 20 minutes from the affected stretch of the road. I thought perhaps we could get around it and rejoin the interstate on the other side. I found a route. It was long-winded, and some of the roads looked pretty rural. I knew it would add at least an hour to our journey, but I figured it was better than sitting in traffic indefinitely, so I left the interstate at the next exit. At first it went smoothly, and we were in high spirits. Lucy was munching on pretzels, and Jamie was singing along to the radio, but as we ventured further into the countryside, I realized the road I planned to take was a footpath, not wide enough for a car. This hadn't been obvious on the map. I did a U-turn, hoping there was another way. I drove around, but didn't find one. It was getting dark. The girls were silent, concern growing. Let's just get back to the interstate, Jamie suggested. I put the interstate into the sat-nav, but it lost connection. My cheap car didn't have a built-in sat-nav. I was using my phone, which needed some kind of internet connection to plan a route. I tried to find my way back to the interstate without the sat-nav's help, but it was hopeless. I thought my phone would eventually pick up a connection, but it didn't. This made me certain we were headed in the wrong direction, but every time I turned around or tried a different road, we got more lost. It was soon pitch black, my headlights the only illumination in the wilderness. The others looked nervous. Lucy blurted, we need to call 911. Jamie laughed, way to overreact, she chuckled. We need to call someone, I said, planning to call my dad. But there was no signal, of course. My phone soon ran out of battery, so did Lucy's. Hers didn't have much to begin with, and the sat-nav had drained mine. Jamie's was still going, but she had no signal to call anyone. I noticed the car was getting low on fuel. I didn't tell the others because I didn't want to alarm them. My car was also struggling on the potholed roads, and I feared we'd get a puncture. Then we saw lights ahead. It was a building. Jamie whooped with joy. Lucy had tears in her eyes. I drove towards it, soon realizing it was a motel. It was nearly 10 p.m. We decided we'd have to stay here tonight and lose our money on the hotel we booked. I was exhausted, and it would be easier to find our way back to the interstate in daylight. There were 11 other vehicles in the car park. I was surprised a motel this far out back and beyond would have so many visitors. I hoped it wasn't some posh retreat we couldn't afford, otherwise we'd be sleeping in the car. I figured at least we'd found somewhere to ask directions. The motel turned out to be very reasonably priced. The decor in the office was strikingly old-fashioned. Jamie muttered something about Bates Motel. I cringed, hoping the elderly woman behind the front desk hadn't heard. She introduced herself as Mrs. Morris. She was keen to help and kindly gave me a bottle of fuel for my car, but she didn't seem to know what a sat-nav was when I explained our predicament. She also claimed there wasn't an interstate nearby. This panicked me. I worried with all the wrong turns we might be wildly off course. But Mrs. Morris looked to be in her 70s or 80s. I wondered if she was confused because you would expect a local motel owner to be aware of the interstate. The motel didn't offer rooms with enough beds for three people, so we took two rooms with Lucy and I sharing a bed and Jamie in her own room. There was an inside door connecting our rooms. This could be locked if the people in the next room are strangers, but we kept it unlocked for Jamie. We said goodnight and I hurried to get ready for bed as we planned to leave early the next day. I plugged my phone into charge and was about to turn out the lights when Jamie came running through the connecting door. She had a towel around her body and shampoo in her hair. What's wrong? She asked urgently. I was in the shower. Confused, I asked what she was talking about. You were hammering on my door screaming, she replied. 
I glanced at Lucy in confusion. I said, why would I knock when the door's unlocked? It was the outside door, Jamie replied. I could see her piecing it together. It couldn't have been me. I wouldn't have gone to the outside door when I could use the connecting door. I was sure it was you, Jamie added. I glanced at Lucy again. It didn't make sense. Neither of us had left our room. With our room being adjacent to Jamie's, we would have heard if someone had been at her door, especially if they were screaming. I looked at Jamie expecting her to announce it was a joke, but she looked confused and borderline terrified. It's probably nothing to worry about, I said, trying to reassure her. I wondered if this really was Bates Motel, but kept the thought to myself. Double check the outside door is locked, I added, then whoever was out there can't get in. Lucy went to the bathroom, but before she closed the door, she ran back out shrieking. Jamie and I asked what was wrong in unison. There was an old woman at the window. Was it Mrs. Morris? I asked. She wasn't that old, Lucy replied before she and Jamie started getting hysterical. I went to the bathroom after calming them down. I feared if they kept screaming, Mrs. Morris would ask us to leave and we had nowhere else to go. The only window was tiny and high up. Nobody was there now. I wasn't worried. There were bars on the outside to prevent entry, and most people wouldn't fit through such a small window anyway. There was no window in the bedroom. I thought this was a bit odd, but it didn't really matter. If anything, it made it harder for intruders to break in. I did my best to convince the others that nobody could get into our rooms, and we should go to bed. I was exhausted. I'm really hungry, Lucy moaned. There was little I could do. There was no room service, and we had no snacks left. I suggested we just get some sleep to pass the time until we could get food in the morning. My sleep was fitful because Lucy's tossing and turning kept waking me. At 5.30 a.m., she said she couldn't sleep and asked if we could get food. So I showered, hoping the breakfast hall would be open by the time I was done. It turned out there wasn't a breakfast hall, but Mrs. Morris drew us a map to the nearest diner. She said her friend Gus's omelets were sublime and to tell him she sent us. It took 20 minutes to drive to the diner. It was busier than I would have expected given the hour, but there were trucks outside, so I assumed most of the customers were delivery drivers. That's odd, Lucy said, pointing to a display on the wall. There was a memorial for Gus, the original owner of the place. This confirmed my suspicion that Mrs. Morris wasn't all there. After enjoying a delicious cooked breakfast, omelets were not on the menu, we returned to the car, planning to check out of the motel and collect our belongings before going on our way. My interview was at noon. We would be cutting it fine. I'm sure you can understand my frustration when we got lost. It didn't make any sense. I was sure of the way back to the motel. We had Mrs. Morris's map and I had no issues on the way to the diner. There was an overgrown plot of grass where I expected the motel to be. I drove through the country lanes searching for the motel before somehow ending up back at the diner. I went in to ask for directions feeling deflated, knowing I'd almost certainly miss my interview. The waitress gave me a knowing smile when I asked how to get to the motel. So it happened to you too, she said. I looked at her in confusion, just wanting the directions. This happens from time to time, she explained. People see the old motel, one customer even swore he stayed there. He seemed perfectly sane, that was the weird part. The motel burned to the ground 30 years ago. There was a gas explosion. Luckily, the staff hadn't arrived yet, but the owner, Marjorie, and 15 guests died. What was Marjorie's last name? I asked, my voice and hands shaking. Morris, an old man at the counter replied. Lovely woman, the place burnt down 30 years ago today, in fact, around 6.45 a.m. Plans for the new section of the interstate were announced shortly after, so it was never rebuilt. The land wouldn't be good for anything commercial. Nobody ever drives through there unless they're lost. It's a funny old tale what happened to my brother-in-law. He survived that night after some crazy lady told him he'd die if he stayed. Saved his life, it did. He still feels guilty for not warning everyone else, but he didn't take the woman seriously. Only he couldn't sleep after running into her, so he packed up and left. I felt like the floor was going to drop out from under me. I gripped the counter for stability, my breath coming in gasps. The waitress guided me to a booth. It's all right, honey, she said. It's sad, but it was 30 years ago. They're at peace now. You don't understand, I told her through heavy breaths. Jamie's still inside. We drove back to the empty plot where the motel used to be. Having confirmed with the waitress this was the right place, we shouldn't have gone to breakfast without Jamie. It was early and she was asleep. I didn't want to disturb her. Lucy was able to get a weak 3G connection on her phone. There had been none yesterday. I laughed, realizing 3G didn't exist 30 years ago. 
My laughter gave way to gut-wrenching sobs. Lucy held my hand as I cried. Internet searches confirmed what the people in the diner told us. The old motel was gone. I was desperate to know how Jamie died. Did she fade like a ghost or did she experience the explosion? Did she die quickly or was she trapped in the flames? Then something occurred to me. If the motel were to appear again, would Jamie still be alive? Could I get her out? I rented a small cottage nearby but hardly spent any time there. I'd sit in my car entire days and nights waiting for the motel to appear. It never did, not even on the anniversary of the explosion. Lucy eventually persuaded me to move on with my life. I finally went to college, having deferred for two years. But I always returned to the site of the motel on the anniversary of the explosion, hoping against hope it would reappear. Last year, it did. I sprinted from my car to Jamie's room, banging on the door, screaming her name. Nobody answered. I remembered Jamie saying she was in the shower, so I ran around the back of the motel. I stood on a bin to call through what I thought was Jamie's bathroom window, but I must have miscalculated. It was our room. Lucy looked up at me and ran from the room, shrieking. It was surreal seeing my sister 15 years younger than she is now. I called to Lucy, to Jamie, to myself, screaming until my throat was sore, but nobody heard me. I sensed the motel was somehow diminishing my voice. The suspicion was confirmed when I ran back to the front of the motel and tried to bang on the door of the room I shared with Lucy. A force pushed me away, like the door and myself were two magnets repelling. A man called out, asking if I was alright. I must have looked insane, trying to knock and being pushed away by an invisible force. Leave, I screamed at him. You'll die if you stay here. I wanted to smash a window, but the rooms had none. I remembered there was an axe in my car, so I sprinted to get it. I could use it to break Jamie's door down. No invisible force had stopped me reaching her door. Once Jamie was safely out, I'd tell Mrs. Morris to evacuate the motel. I realized I should have done this in the first place. She probably had master keys to all the rooms. I decided to abandon the axe idea and go to the front desk, but when I turned away from my car, the motel was gone. All the cars but my own, gone. The man, gone. I screamed, falling to my knees. I had one chance to save my best friend and I'd failed her. Like I failed her by leaving her alone in the first place. The motel must have vanished when I had my back to it on the way to the car. When we arrived all those years ago, I guess at least one of us must have had it in our field of vision at all times. I wondered if something demonic was at work, but my husband thinks the motel is a ghost of the past or a glitch in time. He has a theory that it would be catastrophic for a future and past self to meet, so the universe does everything in its power to stop this from happening. He thinks that's why I was repelled from getting to my own room, but not Jamie or the man. There's so much I could have tried but didn't. Why didn't I leave a note on my past self's car? Why didn't I warn Mrs. Morris the moment the motel reappeared? I'm yet to get a chance to right these wrongs. The motel hasn't appeared again, but I can promise you this. If it shows itself again in my lifetime, I'm going to save my best friend. <laughs>